Hi, my name is Jason Prufer. I am the author of Small Town Big Music, The Outsized Influence of Kent, Ohio on the History of Rock and Roll. And this is my Mr. Media interview. Some ideas for history books are sitting right in front of our noses, waiting for a smart writer to recognize opportunity and put, put the puzzle pieces together. That's kind of how I imagine Jason Prufer's new book, Small Town, Big Music, The Outsized Influence of Kent, Ohio on the History of Rock and Roll, came into existence. The book captures a lot of great musical moments that occurred in the college town that is home to Kent State University and threads them together in a compelling narrative. It should make a generation of rock and roll critics around the world hunker down and do the same for their communities. Proofer, an experienced music journalist and blogger, grew up in Kent hearing stories of exceptional moments from its past, including the formation of future Eagles guitarist Joe Walsh's campus band, The Measles, the creation of Devo in the school's art department, that time that Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band paid their own way to Ohio from the Jersey Shore to open for and blow away. Black Oak, Arkansas, and post-concert -co post college parties featuring legendary surprise musical guests. Small Town Big Music combines Proofer's original reporting with archived concert reviews, interviews, and photos from the Daily Kent Stater College newspaper to make for a compelling read that will entertain music fans who couldn't even find Kent on a map before now. Jason Proofer, welcome to Mr. Media. Hey, great to be here. Great to have you. Uh, as, a, as an old uh, music critic, uh, concert guy, uh, I, I, I was very jealous. <laughs> I, I, I got a big kick out of this. Um, how did this book come about? Who, who, whose idea was it to put all this together? Because Well, we, the, I mean, really, it's been sort of, I suppose, the subject has been percolating in my head since I figured out that um, there was cool music in this town, which would be, you know, probably age seven, eight or nine years old. But the real birth of the book was in 2010, um, Kent State University celebrated its 100 year anniversary, the centennial. And I'm a 20 year staff member at Kent State University. And I was asked to do some kind of gallery show to commemorate um, something that had happened at Kent State over the last 100 years. And so I just sort of thought to myself, well, there must be, you know, I knew that Bruce Springsteen had, had played here. I knew that, um, you know, Joe Walsh um, launched his career from Kent. I knew Devo had formed here, but I didn't know a lot of the details about that. So um, we did, I did for the library um, a gallery show where, I went back into the old Daily Kent Staters, and I found the original ads for all these great performances. And I, we did um, really high-quality scans and then blew them up and matted them on poster boards and um, showed 40 panels um, in this gallery, in this library, and panels that showed advertisements for Yes on campus and Pink Floyd and Bruce Springsteen and these obscure um, you know, James Gang shows before they were famous, Devo performances before they were famous. And um, at the opening, the opening was a real hit. Um, there were tons of people that showed up for this opening. And a colleague of mine uh, said to me during the opening, she said, you know what, Jason, you should really write a book. And that sort of uh, was the seed that, um, that was planted in my mind. Now, had she said, Jason, you should really write a book. And in order to do that, um, you'll have to do this and this and this and this and this, and you'll have to get past this hurdle and this hurdle and this hurdle. I would have said, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but since she didn't follow that up by telling me what I was actually going to have to go through, um, I ended up actually doing the book. <laughs> and, so uh, that was that was nine years ago. What it was were, a long journey. Yeah, what were the, what were the, the hurdles? I mean... Uh... Well, you know, there was there was copyright clearance and there was um, um, it was originally at a different publisher uh, at first. And um, uh, and and that was a whole thing. Um, there were just tracking down all these different people, all the promoters. I mean, it wasn't so bad. I mean, actually, it was really exciting. But I didn't realize it was going to take me nine years to get from that seed <laughs> to a publication date. I thought that maybe, you know, if I do this, we could do that. We could knock this out in a couple of years. So if somebody would, I suppose I should say, if somebody would have said it'll take you nine years, I would have said, well, you know, 
maybe not. <laughs> well, I, I, it was interesting to me that you used the, uh, the, the, Kent, the Kent State College paper uh, for a lot of material. W- was that part of the clearance issue, or did, did you have well, clearance for that? Well, no, well, that was really where I bounced off from. So originally, you know, I found these ads and I found, you know, original photographs that were um, that were in the um, that were in the um, old Daily Kent Staters. And then I would track down the photographers and the photographers um, would have more photos. Mm. And then they would um, and then they would uh, refer me to somebody else who would refer me to someone else who had photos. And then I would post photos on social media and then people would chime in and say, oh, I was there and I have photos myself. And, um, you know, the copyright clearance, it went, I mean, it was all over the place. I mean, we had a blanket um, copyright, uh, we had a blanket clearance from the university to republish anything from those old Daily Kent Staters and from the yearbooks. But we also went the extra mile to try and get in touch with every single writer and every single photographer to get an additional clearance, even though we already had a clearance. Um, just to make sure that everybody was was cool with this coming out, I didn't want any surprises mm-hmm. when this this came out. So you know that that was like that was one hurdle, but that was I wouldn't say it was a it was a major hurdle. It was just a long process. You know, there were a lot of different people who contributed to this. You know, in ways that they didn't even know about. You know, there was you know that that person who wrote that Clash article had no idea that you know thirty plus years from now that somebody would be contacting them. And, <laughs> you know, so so there there was a lot of that. Um, yeah, that but, but, that took yeah, me back long. to my own Clash experience of seeing them at the Orlando Highlight. I want to say in eighty three, not long oh, after wow. that story was written, and somewhere around here, I still have the set list uh, that uh, I think it was. I think it was Joe Strummer's uh, set list. Then I have that somewhere. Was that for was that for Combat Rock or was that for the next one? I I honestly can't remember. I'd have to look it up. But yeah, I just I'm reading that. I went yeah, and that was a zoo. <laughs> that was a crazy. <laughs> that was crazy. Um, at, at the time, I mean, they were the they could do no wrong. I mean, they were at the top of the world. Yeah. You know, Joe Strummer would later say he went from hero to zero because by 1985 nobody cared about the Clash, but in 1983 they were the greatest thing on the planet you know yeah so. and I, I would i would argue that that today they're probably back to where they were you know in 83 absolutely but, but there was definitely absolutely. that period of time i mean in 93 of course the world was changing all the alt rock stuff was was coming in and superseding all the the punk and the new wave stuff and yeah it's just but when you put it all together wow um yeah. so um i know there's a lot of people who may tune into this and be wondering can't Ohio. What mm. the hell is Kent, Ohio? So, uh, are you a, a born and bred there? Have you been there? Yeah. All right. So that, tell us about Kent, Ohio. It doesn't have so, to be just the music stuff, but just tell us about the flavor of, of Kent. So it's, it's a small college town, or I would say maybe medium sized college town, probably 30,000, 30,000 residents, 30,000 students. So about 60,000, you know, when the school year is going. Um, really what it's most famous for is the shootings that happened here on May 4th, 1970. I mean, that was a, a lot of people, at least around here, consider that really the the, the sort of a line of demarc- uh, demarcation, uh, if, that, if that's, is that the right word, line of demarcation between like the 60s and the 70s mm-hmm. happened, um, you know, when, when the shootings happened and, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young wrote that famous song Ohio. about the town and about the shootings and all that. So it's a culturally rich um, college town, you know, in, in Northeast Ohio, um, surrounded by, how shall I put it, not so culturally enriched towns. Um, so we're like a little oasis here of culture um, among, you know, a thousand miles in every direction of not so much culture, I should say. I mean, there's Cleveland and there's Akron. I mean, that's that's nearby, too. Mm-hmm. But it's just um, it's kind of unusual that this little town would have um, all these great, um, exciting um, rock and roll stories. Um, that, that occurred here. And that's largely because of the university, because, um, you know, Kent State is the only real um, college in Northeast Ohio where you go away to go to college. You know, like um, there's a lot of commuter colleges. Um, Akron University um, is a commuter college. Cleveland State is a commuter college. But Kent State is where you go and you spend your first two years living in a dormitory and you live in the town and you have, you know, you have 30,000 
or, you know, 10,000, I would say, freshmen, you know, wide-eyed and ready to take on the world. And oftentimes they use this university and its facilities and this town as their springboard. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a lot, you have a lot of college kids over the past 100 years mm -hmm. who have big ideas that they have succeeded in bringing to Kent, you know. And I'm thinking just for reference, uh, probably similar to, say, Gainesville, Florida. Uh, sure, absolutely. Or... or um, which, which, Georgia. Well, and I was going to say Gainesville, it, it, which uh, sent uh, also another, a member of the Eagles off to California at some point. Um, uh, Athens, right, Athens, Georgia, that type of thing, where it's like an oasis of, uh, of uh, students. Oh, and of culture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, is it, uh, what else is it known for? Before we get focus in, in on the music, uh, obviously, and I want to come back to May 4th in a second, but... Is it is it known for um, for food? Is it known for you know? Is, are there great places to to hang out? Is it sure? Yeah, there's lots of uh, bars and clubs and and um, music venues and and you know it ebbs and it flows. And sometimes you have really great periods of live music, and sometimes you have um, not so great periods of live music. But it always you know when you inject, you know, 10,000 new freshmen every year, every fall into this place, it, you know, it gets revitalized, you know, in a different way every time. Excuse me. So, you know, it, it, it's known for the university, really. I mean, it's also, um, you know, the Cuyahoga River flows through here. Um, it's, a, you know, it was originally a canal town, then it was a railroad town, and then it eventually settled into being a college town. Um, yeah, there's great restaurants, and you know, there's a little bit of an international flavor here in in a, in a in an unsuspecting uh, place in the Midwest, I should say. And uh, now you were born uh, about five years after uh, the uh, 1970 yes. incident, and we're actually I was just doing the math in my head. Next year will next year being 2020, it will actually be the fi it's hard to believe it'd be the 50th anniversary. Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, don't do the math, but I was nine and a half, I think, when the shooting happened. Is the town forever scarred by that? Are there reminders of it all everywhere, or is it is it really kind of faded at this point? No, absolutely it is scarred by it. I mean, everybody, it's the topic of conversation all the time here. You know, nobody forgot it. And, it, and those shootings, I mean, you know, it, they, they took place over the course of a lunch hour. Um, basically, um, but it was really four days that led up to it, and then there was a National Guard presence in this town for an entire month after that, where on you know for the, the entire city had been taken over by the military. Um, nobody who lived here at this time has forgotten it, and nobody who has come up here or gone to school here um, has has ever not been affected by it. So it's still a, a very big deal in this town. And the, the 50th anniversary coming up, there's all kinds of stuff being planned for it. You know, there's a huge committee on campus um, that it goes right up to the president's, uh, up to the executive office that are, are planning for the 50th. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, a, it was a big deal then and it's a big deal now. And for people who may be a little younger, don't know, there, there's a, obviously there's the song you mentioned, uh, Ohio. Is it CSN or was it CSNY? CSNY, CSNY and Neil Young wrote the song. Okay, and uh, there was a photo from that incident where there's a woman with her arms spread, yes. uh, standing o or kneeling over uh, someone who's been shot, and that that image is probably as famous, I think, in, in the United States as any any of the the images we could probably think of from the Vietnam War, which is happening at the same time. And sure, uh, it really just Absolutely. a, I think it was stunning at the time for people. To, that this happened on American soil. It was, it was just, it rocked people. Yeah, it was when the Vietnam War came home. And yeah. It really changed a lot of attitudes about, um, about the war uh, in Vietnam and, um, you know, and, and where it was going. So and really, it was the the incident um, was a reaction to President Nixon's expansion of the war in Vietnam into Cambodia. Mm -hmm. That's what people were so angry about. And, you know, it was really the perfect storm to for, for this kind of, you know, horror show to happen around here. Um, but, you know, that's what happened. You know, both my parents were um, involved in, in May 4th, 1970. My father was a 40-year faculty member here. Um, and my mother was a, um, was a junior on campus. Wow. And they both witnessed it. They were not the rabble-rousers. They did not, they, they did not ha take part in the incident, but they were witnesses to it. Wow. So, yeah. 
so um, it's kind of a hard thing to come off of that and right. talk well, about you know, rock. Well, you know, it was that incident that really sort of blacked out all this other information. You know, because when people think about the history of this town, they think about it all just defaults to May 4th. Right. You know, so anything else that happened, like the James Gang formed here, you know, and, and Devo forming here and all these great concerts that happened here. And there were tons of them. Mm -hmm. You know, this all got blacked out because, you know, there's 30 books about May 4th. Maybe I think there's more than 30, mm -hmm. but there were no books about all this great music that had happened here. You know, maybe it took somebody who was born and raised here to sort of figure out that maybe this should be chronicled or documented. Um, because everybody else who isn't from around here, they think of the history of this town as being May 4th, 1970. And this town was not born on, nor did it die on May 4th, 1970. You know, it's still a strong and raging college town to this day. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of what you deal with in the book comes forward from that point, though. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah. Sure. So, so tell us, let, let's get back to the book and, and music. What mm -hmm. was the first big musical development after that? After May 4th? Well, Devo forms because of May 4th. You know, um, Jerry Casale and Bob Lewis were witnesses to the, I mean, they were actually part of, you know, they were SDS and, and you know, they, um, they felt that what they were seeing was, um, was, you know, Bob Lewis was an anthropology uh, major and Jerry Caselli was an art major, and they felt that what they were seeing um, on May 4th, 1970 was not an, an evolution, but it was a de-evolution, yeah. you know, and if you read up anything on Devo, you know that ground zero for them is May 4th, 1970, and Mark Mothersbaugh was around here, too. He wasn't an actual witness to the, he wasn't a, an eyewitness to the shootings, but he was in town on that day, too, and was affected by it, mm -hmm. you know. So, so you know, really, there was that though. Though um, the 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 book really starts in 1965. The book really starts five years before the shootings, and that's with Joe Walsh arriving in town on a on a train from New Jersey for for his freshman year, and, and so really it starts six, in 1965 and, and goes forward. But it was really that crowd that or those students that started to come up here in 1965 and 1966 who were the ones who were front row center on May 4th, 1970. Mm. You know. Tell me about well let's 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 go with Walsh then. Tell me about uh, how far along you were in this and at what point you get you get Walsh involved. You talk to him. He obviously he as I mentioned he wrote the introduction for the book so he right. and and it seemed the other before you answer the other thing I I took from it was uh, there's a great oh I love this photo. There's a photo of him riding as the grand marshal of a parade yes. uh, through Kent <laughs> and it's it's kind of hysterical in that it is a small town. I mean, it's a, yeah. you know, and you see the picture and it's like, there he is in the, in the, the convertible and he's sitting up on it. And, you know, it's not like going through the concrete canyons of New York. There's no. a, there's a couple of dozen people on the street across from him. And, you know, so anyway, yeah. so tell us a little bit about how, how you come to Walsh's uh, attention and, and he gets involved in this. So Joe Walsh was a resident of Kent from 1965 to about 1971. Hmm. And in his first band in Kent was the Measles. And then um, when the Measles broke up, he eventually joined the James Gang and then fronted the James Gang. And then the James Gang took off from Kent. You know, the James Gang had a two-year residency in Kent from 1968 through 1970. <laughs> Excuse me. Actually, it was like two and a half years. They played at a bar in downtown Kent called JB's every Thursday and Sunday night with no opening act. Three sets a night for one dollar. Hmm. You could see the James Gang just you know rock out just like a three piece you know power you know you know power trio. And they, it was interesting. I ended up, I interviewed the drummer for the James Gang, uh, Jimmy Fox, and he said that they would, they would play on Thursday and Sunday night at JB's, and that left Friday and Saturday night open so that they could play the big shows and the festivals, and they could open for Led Zeppelin and the Who, and that's really where they took off. And then Joe Walsh becomes Joe Walsh, you know, and then he becomes, a, gets to the Eagles, and you know, I mean, the Eagles outsell. The Beatles and Michael Jackson. I mean, they're they're you know Joe Walsh joins the Eagles right when they're uh, recording um, uh, Hotel California, the album Hotel California, 
And the producer for the Hotel California album is Bill Sismic. I think that's how you pronounce his name. And he is also the producer of the first James Gang album. Which, which the cover, uh, the front and back cover of those album of that album, um, were, those photos were all taken in Kent, and it was during their Kent during the JB's residency, sixty eight, sixty nine, seventy, um, that this album uh, comes up from. So um, Joe Walsh takes uh, takes himself and his producer all the way to the Eagles. But okay, so how does Joe Walsh get involved in my book? That's a great question. So Joe Walsh was actually on campus on May fourth, nineteen seventy. He was a witness to the shootings. And Joe Walsh was um, researching uh, May 4th for a documentary that he's working on. And he came to Kent State um, two years ago in February of 2017 to, um, to, take a, um, to, to see what our holdings are in this library. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you right now from the Kent State University Library. I'm actually on my one-hour break to, to talk to you. Like I said, I'm a staff member here. We have the largest holdings um, of you know May Fourth photographs and papers and and films um, and they're all in our special collections and archives. And Joe wanted to visit um, our library in order to see what kind of holdings we have for his documentary. So um, the provost of the university is the one who handled Joe Walsh coming to campus, and we had about and he had about twenty four or forty eight hours notice that he was coming to campus coming on campus. So the provost contacted the dean of the library and said, hey, we've got Joe coming to the university. And he says to the dean, he says, do we have anything rock and roll we could show him so that he feels at home here? <laughs> and so the dean says, I think I know a guy and, uh, and let, let me see. So it was a Sunday night and I never checked my work email on a Sunday night. But for some reason I did. And um, there was an email from the dean, and he says, Jason, Joe Walsh is going to be on campus tomorrow. He's gonna be in the, he says he's going to be in the library at 11 a.m. Do we have anything that we could show Joe that's rock and roll related that he would uh, maybe enjoy or could relate to? And I said, well, yeah, because this was by 2017. Remember, this is seven years in on the book. Mm -hmm. By 2017, I had um, the manuscript already designed and written for this thing. And so, um, and so I said, yeah, I have my, um, I have my manuscript. And he says, okay, um, Joe's in at 11 a.m. I'll come down to your desk at 8 a.m. Let me see what your manuscript is, and I'll see if it's appropriate to show Joe. And I said, okay, sure. And at this point, all we're doing is just making him feel at home on campus. You know, I never, I never tried to reach out to Joe for any help or anything because, first of all, I never thought I'd be able to get a hold of him. Right. You know, I mean, he's, he's so famous. His, his, his brother-in-law is Ringo Starr, you know. <laughs> the guy probably doesn't even have time for Don Henley sometimes, let alone, <laughs> you know, let alone time for me uh, trying to get a hold of him to ask him if I could interview him. And also, I had interviewed enough people in this town who legitimately had a, a mu musical relationship with him while he was here that I felt like I had enough of his story to put in his book to put in the book without him you know and that's not to dismiss him because he's Joe Walsh I just I just never felt like I needed to, to try I just never it just never occurred to me that this that, that him being involved would even be a reality mm -hmm. right so so anyway uh, long, uh, they bring Joe you know Joe comes to the library and the next thing I know um, the provost and Joe Walsh and the Dean are at my desk down in circulation. I mean, I'm a low-level librarian, at least, you know, <laughs> relatively, you know, com compared to, to, to other people who work in this library. And um, Joe is, like, way into the manuscript. We're showing it to him because it's loaded with photos of him. Mm -hmm. And he's got, and not only that, these other concerts that are in there from the time that he was here, he attended. You know, and he worked at as a, as a student. And he had all these stories. And, and I knew all this information about him, too, from all these interviews that I had done with these other people and I was asking him questions based on the interviews that I had done and he was answering these questions that he had not been asked for you know for, for decades mm -hmm. you know if, if ever at all you know when he left Kent I mean he really never looked back but he did spend six years here you know so he did so you know uh, some some really formative years in his life were, were spent here so he was really into talking to me about his time in Kent. So anyway, so then the dean and the provost and Joe, they leave, they go up to special collections and archives, and then I get a call about 20 minutes later from the dean down at my desk, and, and he says, hey, can you come up to the 12th floor, um, come up to the special collections, Joe wants to see the manuscript. And I said, oh, sure, okay. 
So I go up there with the manuscript and, and we put it down on this table and he starts looking at it again. And he's like smitten with this thing. <laughs> and that, that's when that photo was taken of me and Joe and the provost. And you can see it in the mm -hmm. um, introduction, uh, in my introduction uh, of the book. And it's when he's looking at it that he, he says, he starts telling all these stories. And, you know, he gets to, he got to that Elton John photo where Elton was doing the handstand. Right. And he goes, he goes, oh man. He ain't doing that anymore. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he starts talking about Devo. He apparently, it turns out he's this huge Devo fan. Wow. And he loves him. And he starts telling me stories like, oh, I remember Mark Mother's Ball. When he, I, I used to see him on the corner of North Water Street wearing some crazy mask. And I used to think, what the hell's wrong with this guy? <laughs> you know? But then later he became like a huge Devo, Devo fan. And then he finally says out of nowhere, he says, um, do you want me to write a forward for this thing? And I'm just like, uh, yeah, you know, sure. And, and you know, and, and, you know, t t long story short, he, you know, 18 months later, he produced this uh, forward for it. Wow. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm, I'm just getting over a cold here. But that was how it came out. I, I, you know, it was just, you know, luck and, and preparation, I suppose. You know, what is that? Someone I heard, luck is uh, preparation meets opportunity. Right, You right. know, and so, um, and you know what? And then it was at that point that the Kent State University Press went and, and um, because Joe had offered to do the forward, um, Kent State University Press ended up buying out my contract from the um, Kent Historical Society Press because they wanted to put out this book with Joe Walsh, with Joe Walsh's forward. Sure. So that was how I ended up at, at um, Kent State University Press. Um, so that's how Joe Walsh got involved, but it was great. You know, Joe would call me, um, and uh, cause like I said, it took 18 months for him to do the forward. And I, again, you know, when he offered to do it, I didn't think he was going to do it. I didn't think he was going to follow through. Um, but he took down my number and then he would call me, um, and, and he would call me to give me updates on the forward, you know, and he called me once from Fiji. You know, he calls me, Jason, I'm in Fiji. I still have the voicemail. I mean, it was like the middle of the night, I was asleep, and I wake up, and I get this voicemail. He says, Jason, I'm in Fiji, and you need to call me. i got some questions. And so I would call, I, you know, I'd call him back, and, and we would talk about the forward, and then we would just end up talking about music wow. and politics, you know, for the next, like, 30, 40 minutes. It was really cool. Like, we really got on really well. I mean, if he wasn't, you know... If he wasn't Joe Walsh, the superstar, you know, basically a Beatle, I suppose we'd probably be friends because we got along so well. But, you know, he's, you know, he lives in Beverly Hills and, you know, I'm a low level librarian here at uh, Kent State University. But that was how he got involved. And it was really, it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, I don't believe in miracles or anything like that. But if there was anything that was a miracle, you know, that was, that's the closest thing there is to it. So, well, and I don't know how this will compare to that story, but. There's an interesting story in the book about how you got comments from Mark Mothersbaugh. Um, his his uh, let me see if I can set it up and you take it from there. His sister Amy, I think, has an art gallery in town. Yeah, right. And so she was showing some of his work, I think, and he was in town for the for the opening. Something okay, like that. Okay, so actually, so so th this was really early in my research. So this was the summer of 2010. This was before I had even decided that I was going to write a book. And actually, the book starts at, started as a series of online blogs. I mean, I, even though somebody said to me, you should really write a book, I had never I, – I, I just said, okay, well, I, you know, I, writing a book, that, 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 that's a lot. Let me just start writing these stories and putting them out online. You know, and I, I would I would blog I would blog these stories, and then it was the blogs got so popular, they went so viral that that's when Kent Historical Society Press, um, Kent Historical Society approached me and said we'd like to do a book uh, based on your blogs. So that was how it really started. But in the summer of 2010, a friend of mine sent me a newspaper clipping that said that Amy Mothersbaugh's gallery, which is in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, not far from here, hmm. about 20 minutes from here, that she was going to be – that she was doing um, an exhibit featuring her brother's work. And for the opening, uh, Mark Mothersbaugh was going to do a live Skype. Ah. And um, – and this was in the newspaper, and the Skype was going to be at 2 p.m. on this particular day. And I thought, oh, this is this is perfect. Uh, and so if you have any questions, show up, and he'll answer your questions. Well, I had a question. <laughs> and because in my research, I had found that ad for Devo opening for the film Pink Flamingos. Oh, right, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in 1975. This is two years before they would break, mm -hmm. right? So, so they're not – in 1975, Devo are not 
famous. They are they're not even famous in Kent or local, you know, they're just famous among their their weirdo friends around here doing weirdo art projects and making weirdo devolved music. And, and so um, so I had a um, I had scanned this this original ad which shows up in the book and it's actually the ad that Joe Walsh is looking at um, in the photo where you see Joe Walsh and he's he's looking at, at this Pink Flamingos ad. So then I go I go to this opening in Cuyahoga Falls on Front Street and um, they project uh, Mark Mothersbaugh's image on the wall. There's only like 20 people at this opening, maybe 30 people at this opening. And they project his image on the wall and there he is. He's actually in Orlando. He's taking his kids to Disney World. And he says, oh, I'm in Disney World. My kids are here. I'm taking this time out uh, because uh, my sister has, has this show, uh, excuse me, of, of, of my work. And he says, um, does anybody have any questions? And um, nobody was answering any questions. Nobody was raising their hands or anything. Everybody was just sort of like in awe that, you know, <laughs> this projection of Mark Mothersbaugh was talking to them. Right. <clears throat> and then, so then finally I said, yeah, I have a question. And he says, all right, what's your question? And I took the ad. I literally had the print out of the ad. And I put it in front of the camera. And I said, what's going on here? What, you know, <laughs> what is this? And he says, um, I'm seeing pink flamingos. Um, you know, why am I looking at pink flamingos? And then I, and then I hold it up, you know, a little, little more so that you can see where it says with opening act Devo, mm -hmm. um, who, who will be doing weird things or whatever, whatever it says on there. And I said, so Devo opened this, uh, open this, um, movie, open for this movie in 1975 on front campus. Do you remember this? And he says, oh yeah, I remember it. <laughs> and this is what happened. And, <laughs> Out it came, right. and I recorded it. Yeah. You know, I didn't even tell him I was recording for research. I didn't tell him anything like that. Um, I just, um, I just recorded everything that he said, and everything. I didn't even, I couldn't even really hear what he was saying when he was saying it. I could maybe make out about half of what he was saying, but when I went back and listened to the recording, it was fascinating. I was able to figure out everything he was saying, hmm. and I was, and he, you know, he talks about like the octagon, the weird keyboard that they were using that night. And, and, and all that and all that stuff, you know, eventually I had to get his permission to use the his quote in the book because I didn't ask him that night. I had to go through his his publicist later. Um, but that was how, you know, that was how I was able to um, interview Mark Mothersbaugh. It was just me just being stealth and and, you know, kind of sneaky about it. Hmm. But that's how I got it. That's, you know? that's very cool. All right. I want to ask you one more. And just so people know that not everything in the book takes place in the far distant 70s and 80s, uh, you you also got to talk to uh, uh, Patrick Carney of the Black Keys, yes. who also has a connection to Kent. Uh, Absolutely. Tell us, tell us about this. So, um, you know, the Black Keys are famously from Akron, Akron, Ohio. They, they celebrate it. They champion Akron, Ohio. Um, uh, um, but the reality about Northeast Ohio is, you know, they went to Firestone High School in Akron and all that. But the reality in Northeast Ohio is the venues are all in Kent. And when they were cutting their teeth, when Dan Auerbach and Patrick Carney separately pre-2001, when they were in bands and they were cutting their teeth, they were playing in the venues in Kent. And um, I actually, in, 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 in the late 90s, I was also in playing in bands in Kent. You know, I was in my 20s. Um, at that point. And, um, and, and we're like the same age, although I never knew Patrick Carney and I never knew Dan Arbach when they were, um, you know, even though we were the same age and running around with, with similar crowds, I never actually knew them. Um, but, um, uh, later I found out I had a lot of mutual friends and this one day, um, I was, um, just on my Facebook or whatever. And I saw, uh, about five photos come through my newsfeed that showed Patrick Carney looking like he must've been like 17 years old playing in 1997 at the Europe gyro, which is when, which is the same time that my band was playing. Of course, I was like 22 at the time. 21 i was playing at the europe gyro like it didn't even label it wasn't even labeled that this is patrick carney playing at the europe gyro it was just these photos and i'm like that's patrick carney and he's at the europe gyro <laughs> and this is crazy and i figured out who the i figured out who the photographer was and i figured out who who were in the photos and i just started going to those people and asking them about what they remembered about that night and then a childhood friend of mine, a guy named Jamie Stillman, um, actually later became the Black Keys tour manager. 
and I went through him to um, to to try and hook up a um, a phone call uh, interview with Patrick Carney, and um, I got, actually it was his wife that ended up setting it up. And actually, I I emailed her, and then within forty eight hours, on the, I was on the phone with Patrick. And he was, he couldn't wait to talk to me about the photos and about his time in Kent and how cool he thought Kent was and the mystique of Kent and all this kind of stuff. He, he was great. And actually, I did the interview, I think it was in April of 2013, and he was driving from his home in Nashville to Dan Arbach's studio, which was an hour away from his home, um, to record the, um, he was recording the Turn Blue album. Hmm. So the conversation that we had was from the time he got in his car at his house to the time he arrived at the studio to st- to lay down tracks for Turn Blue. Mm-hmm. So that was really cool. Uh, uh, that was that was one of my favorite interviews. And also, since we're the same age, you know, or similar age, we can relate on that level. So so it was it was really cool talking to him. That's great. Now we're. Yes, we're- the Black Keys have their roots have their roots performing in the venues in Kent before they were the Black Keys. Mm-hmm. Lots of shows, lots of lots of you know. There, there's lots of information about that now. So I want to tell people that as the enthusiasm that you're seeing coming off of Jason Prufer as he tells these stories comes out in the book. So you, you you can you know you can you can watch this and then go read the book and you'll see it's a lot of fun and you'll see why in the introduction of this interview I said that there should be a generation of uh, rock music. Uh, critics around the world who are thinking, oh my God, I got to do this story for where I, where, where I live. Um, so before we run out of time, and I still had a lot of more questions for you, but <laughs> I, uh, this has been fun. Um, so talk just a minute or two about, uh, I got a kick out of this for, uh, I want to say for Springsteen, there's uh, Anthony Kiedis and Flea of the Red, Red Hot Chili Peppers. And then uh, there's a great moment with uh, Slim Jim Phantom of the Stray Cats. You actually collected some stories of things that happened after concerts. Uh, now, the, none of these bands that I'm talking about here, Springsteen, the Chili Peppers, or the Stray Cats, they don't have a specific connection to Kent, but they came through Kent and they left a little something. Um, you know, they. How did they you? Left, get- you know, they, they left an impression. You know, when I was, um, about, you know, when the Red Hot Chili Peppers hit in um, ninety really in like 1990, 89 through like Blood Sugar, Sex Magic, what was that, 92, 91, and all that, there was a story that floated around Kent that the Red Hot Chili Peppers had played at JB's, which is that same club that um, that the James Gang had the residency at in 68, 69, but it was somewhere in the early 80s that the Red Hot Chili Peppers came through. There was some story, and I always remembered that there was some story, and there were variations of the story, <laughs> and it never came from anybody who experienced it, but there was just some story. And then in the social media age, um, I think it was in 2012, the flyer for the performance actually popped up uh, on Facebook. <laughs> and, it was, and the flyer popped up uh, from... The guy who was in the opening band that night in 1984, um, and so um, that was who posted it. And um, and the flyer wasn't a good enough quality to put in the um, to put in the book, um, unfortunately. Um, but that was really the springboard for me um, uh, going back and trying to figure out what happened. So um, I initially talked to the to the singer from the opening act, and then he put me in touch with the actual promoter of the performance, who then put me in touch with the guy who drove them around the town all night. Mm-hmm. And then I was put in touch with the guy who hosted the party where the Red Hot Chili Peppers ended up in College Towers. And, you know, and this was on their first tour. So they were just a bunch of punk asses from Los <laughs> Angeles off their first album. I mean, almost unknown. You know, I mean, they were still several albums away from becoming like an international, you know, superstar act. So, um, you know, what's interesting about with the Red Hot Chili Peppers is I suspect they don't remember a thing about that night in 1984 that they spent in town. But all these people who were there from the town who saw the performance, who were at this party, who drove them around, who who booked the show, they remember everything. Mm -hmm. You know, so I went back to them to piece together, you know, the, everything that happened that brought them to town and their entire time that they were here. And it turns out there were a bunch of crazy stories that, <laughs> you know, they probably will never come back to this town again. Or they probably left here. They probably don't even remember. But they probably left here saying, well, we're never going to come back to that piece of shit town again. Wow. <laughs> All right, so last question. We'll let sure. you go. If you could put together a Kent supergroup, 
All right, this would be a ba- this would be a band not not of people who pass through, but people who had genuine roots in Kent. Could be Patrick Carney, could be you know Joe Walsh, whoever. Just I put you on the spot. Can you put together a a super. Kent supergroup, and then we'll 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 have to refer people to the book for the rest. <laughs> so okay, so uh, uh, Patrick Carney on drums. Um, we'll put Chrissy Hine on lead vocals. Um, we didn't even get well, to Chrissy Hind, isn't that crazy? Yeah, and she, you know, I'll tell you what, in her auto, her autobiography came out a couple years ago, and there's three whole chapters about the time she lived in Kent, and she lived here from 69 to 71. Mm-hmm. That's a whole other thing. So, yeah, Chrissy Hind on vocals, Patrick Carney on drums, we'll put Joe Walsh on uh, lead guitar, and we'll put Jerry Casale on bass. We'll, we'll give everybody their strengths. Awesome. Wait, Mother's Bar doesn't even make the band, huh? Uh, we'll put them on keys. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, folks, listen, uh, it, the book is as much fun as listening to Jason is talk about it. Uh, and you can find his book, uh, Small Town, Big Music, The Outsized Influence of Kent, Ohio on the History of Rock and Roll uh, in great stores everywhere. Or you can order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com. If you are watching the video on MrMedia.com uh, or on YouTube for that matter, well, if you're watching on MrMedia.com, uh, below the video, you'll see the cover of the book. You can click right on it. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you look in the information underneath the video, you'll see a link to Amazon. You can click on it. It'll take you right to it. Uh, it it's a big uh, coffee table book with great pictures. Uh, there's a great picture of Chrissy Hind, as I recall, on the front of the automobile. Isn't that the yeah. right? Yeah. I, and I've seen that one before. It's a great picture of her. It's great to see yeah. her that young. Um, so order the book. And uh, Jason, can people find you or the book uh, on social media, on the web? You know, look me up on Facebook, Jason Proofer. Um, I, you know, if you're interested in music, send me a friend request. I'll always accept it. And uh, feel free to chat with me. Uh, you know, look me up on Messenger. I'm always willing. I always love talking with anybody about music. So Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, Jason Proofer, uh, fun book, fun conversation. And thanks so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Hey, thank you. right now this has already been the <laughs> highlight of my day